be here now. Just be here now. When you were conscious of what you were doing and when you were conscious of how you were doing it, then it is going to be feasible for you to be able to detect what kind of changes may be happening inside your organism as a result of the things you're doing and to detect when your organism has decided that it needs to change things around. Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archived teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello and welcome to Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host and Dr. Sabota's media manager. On this episode, Dr. Sabota goes into depth about habits and he talks about Dina Charya, the concept in Ayurveda, but really gives us an in-depth look at what that actually means. He also talks about ritual and its importance. I hope that you enjoy this episode. And if you'd like to study with Dr. Svoboda, you can go to drsvoboda.teachable.com and look at all of the courses that are available to you there. That's drsvoboda.teachable.com. And we hope you enjoy this episode. Sanskrit is a language that I find most interesting. One of the reasons I find it interesting is the same reason I find other languages interesting, that I can follow words from their roots into the meanings that they have accumulated over the many years that they have been used by human beings. One of those words is acharya. Acharya comes from the root chara, and chara means to move. <clears throat> the Ayurvedic sage Charaka was called that because the people who followed his prescriptions for study moved about in the forest, moved about in natural areas, and learned from nature itself much of what they knew about the science of life, that is to say, Ayurveda. Acharya means someone who can teach you how to move, that is, teach you how to perform some activity or other. So Acharya is a word that is sometimes used in modern India to mean a teacher. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Ayurvedic Medicine and Science degree from the University of Pune. That's the name of the degree in English. The Sanskrit name of the degree is Ayurved Acharya, meaning that the expectation of the University of Pune is that after I have completed the course of study and passed the exams, that I ought to be able to teach people how to live their lives according to the tenets of Ayurveda as I have been taught them. Acharya can mean any kind of teacher of any subject. And it can also relate to practices that are taught, that are meant to facilitate one's alignment with reality in some way. So, for example, in Ayurveda, we have dinacharya that represents what would be ideal for your daily routine, and we have rutucharya, and that means <clears throat> the practices that would be appropriate uh, for you to perform during particular seasons of the year. And the emphasis on both dinacharya and 
Urtucharya, though even more substantially Dinacharya, is the establishment of healthy habits. And if we look into that word habit, we will find that originally it was the past participle of the Latin word, the Latin verb habere, which meant to have, to position, to hold, think, consider, keep. And so a habit was something that had been established in some way. Before it came into English as a repetitive procedure that one performs more or less consciously, uh, but often more unconsciously and as a sort of second nature, it meant a religious garment. So that once you had been positioned in a religious order, for example, you would be given a garment. So you would be reminded always that you had been positioned into that religious order. So Dinacharya is all about establishing healthy habits. We can also call it, or people do call it, the daily routine. And that word routine comes from the root or the word root. And root means a road. In fact, root originally came from the same Latin root that we get the word rupture because the implication was that you would rupture a a, 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 a forest or you would rupture a desert, a, you would rupture a natural area by inserting a road into it. And in fact, that we, we find even now that in the Amazon, wherever the road goes, there is tremendous destruction that goes on secondary to the road. So the road really is creating a rupture in ecosystems in communities, in all sorts of ways. Ironic, therefore, it is that that word that represents disorganization has come to mean a kind of habitual organization. But such is the reality of the human being. It is often characterized by inverse results. That is, you desire to get something and you often end up with just its opposite. And that is very much the case what happens with habits. It is easy to create habits if you do them often enough and it can become very difficult to get rid of them. And many of us have created habits for ourselves that were created unconsciously, that are not benefiting us in any way. And many of those habits have become integrated into our personalities so that we've become creatures of habit. And there are spiritual teachers who teach that the only spiritual practice that anyone needs to do is discover what sort of habits you have, habits of action, habits of thinking, habits of speech, and break up those habits. The more you break up the habits, the more possible it becomes for you to actually act instead of react. And this is de definitely a desirable thing to do. We want to break up habits that are not useful, but we do want to establish habits that are useful. We can feel free to change those habits around, but we want to have some kind of habits when, it when, when, when we are examining the question of the physical organism. And we want to have some kind of habits because um, the physical body is something that is a creature of habit. It likes very much going to sleep at the same time, getting up at the same time, eating at the same time, acting, working at the same time, meditating at the same time, because there is in your organism a sort of tendency for expectation. And this is why we are able to create habits. It's the same reason that you can, for example, get into your car 
and drive down the road without having to go through the same process that you did when you were studying how to drive. At that time, you had to remind yourself actively, this is the steering wheel, this is the brake pedal, this is the accelerator, this is what I do, and this is how I do it. Once you've established inside yourself what you needs to be done and how it needs to be done, you permit muscle memory to take over. And the good side of that is that permits you to drive down the road without having to do all of this thinking and remembering actively. You're doing it, but you're doing it in a subconscious, unconscious kind of way. Of course, there, there, is, there is no benefit that does not have some potential detriment to it. And the result is that because you can drive down the road without having to actively pay attention to everything you're doing all the time, there is a great tendency nowadays to be wanting to talk on the phone and text and do other kinds of things that you should not be doing behind the wheel, but you, the, that you think that you can do because you have established a habit that permits you to think that you are doing something so well that you can multitask. There is no such thing as multitasking. For some people, there is such a thing as quickly switching back and forth between things you're focusing on. But there is, you cannot focus, a human being cannot focus on two things at one time. They can have several things in the background, but at one time, they can only be focusing on one thing. So what we do want in Ayurveda and also from the perspective of spiritual development is we want you to be as conscious as possible of what you're doing. Because when you were conscious of what you were doing and when you were conscious of how you were doing it, then it is going to be feasible for you to be able to detect what kind of changes may be happening inside your organism as a result of the things you're doing and to detect when your organism has decided that it needs to change things around. If you are not paying attention to your organism, then you will either be generating habits without any kind of awareness at all. This would be from the tamas perspective, and you will get tamas kind of results. If you're not paying attention to what you do, then what's going to happen is that things are going to accumulate. They may be useful, they may not be useful, but they'll be familiar and you will continue following them. And probably because they're familiar, they will not be so useful and probably they will re result eventually in bad results. And you will wonder what happened, but it's because you were not paying attention to what was going on. The more rajas mo mediated way of doing things is to actively study all the different possible routines and calculate in your mind how you might do them and do one and then decide that's not exactly appropriate and do the next one, and then shift to a third and never really do any kind of routine long enough in order to be able to identify, not theoretically, but physiologically with your intuition, which is based at your hotter point below your navel, using that as your guide to detect how your organism physiologically feels about what you've been doing. And that's where the sattva aspect of things come in. Now, people often think of sattva as somehow relating solely to the thinking mind, and to some degree that's true. But sattva, remember, sat means real or true, and tva means ness. So Sattva means living with reality. And that means if you're trying to figure out what to do with your physical body, you need to know how to live with physical reality. And that means you need to be able to perceive what's going on in your physical reality, not theoretically, not by ignoring the situation, but by actively sensing for which purpose you're going to have to become familiar with your prana. So what we do want to do is have sort the, the same sort of beneficial practices that become second nature, the same sorts of things that we do, like, for example, in driving the car. And uh, uh, my aunt, Elnora, used to be a, a, an absolute master or mistress of baking pies. 
and she could, and she would always make the crust from scratch and she would make everything. And, and she could be talking and she could be uh, just instructing her kids to be doing this. And she could be doing all of that while she was simply going through all of the process that was necessary to bake the pie. And the pies were always delicious. So she had make she had made pie baking second nature for her. You may or may not want to do that for yourself, but there are certain things that should be second nature for everybody. And that should be start off by getting up in the morning. And getting up in the morning should be a, a moment where you, you, you decide how you want to do it. It's always uh, useful to consider waking up, remaining where you are, remembering to be grateful that you're alive, remember to be aware that you may pass on this very day and you have a, a, some time left in order to be able to, to continue to evolve and, and align better with the supreme reality. You may want to do some alternate nostril breathing for five or 10 minutes or even meditate for five or 10 minutes before you even get out of bed just to set the, just to set the, uh, the, the flavor for the day. And then it's good during that early, you, you're going to have to uh, clean your mouth and you're going to have to get rid of your waste and you're going to have to uh, sometime during the day exercise. It's often good to do that early in the morning but, so you can also make your prana circulate well. It's good to do some kind of prana, active prana circulating exercise like yoga or tai chi or qigong or whatever. So there are a number of different things that are useful habits that you can introduce into your life. You can change them. You can or alternate. You can move them around. It's good to do them at least for one month, month and a half, two months. That's long enough for your body to become familiarized with them. It's long enough for your body to get into a pattern of understanding of how this might be working for it or not working for it. So the daily, the, the daily routine, of course, then continues to when you eat, how you eat, the, the, the things that you do uh, in the context of, of, uh, of dining, and it relates to when and how you work, and it relates very importantly nowadays to when and how you go to sleep. And one part of that nowadays should be for pretty much everybody to turn all of your screens off at least half an hour before you go to bed and just, again, sit and maybe meditate a little or do some breathing or do some, some very simple stretching or whatever, calming down things, cleaning your teeth again, cleaning everything, and being thankful for the day. In Ayurveda, we say, go back through the day some people say start from the beginning and go to the end. Uh, some people think it's better to start from where you are right there at the end and go back to the beginning. Evaluate how things went. Do not try to uh, experience, uh, apply any kind of guilt or, or other kind of negative emotions. Do this objectively. But if you have done things well, you can be happy. Don't... Uh, overly and needlessly congratulate yourself for that. If there are things you did not do well, do not beat yourself up over that, but rather identify that, be aware of it, and commit yourself not to making that same mistake again in the future. So take out some time before bed so you can get rid of everything that might be hanging on in your head. One... one uh, uh, very useful thing that I recently, recently means a year or so ago, learned listening to a uh, recording of a discourse by a uh, Sufi master from Africa. And that was, he said, that the, one of the best practices he knew was to forgive everybody before going to bed. That is, anybody who has offended you or anybody you've, any offense you've remembered for the past, before you go to bed, just forgive everything, forgive everybody. Remember, you are forgiving not for them, you're forgiving for yourself. So 
this kind of routine, figuring out something that the, a, a nice kind of structure for your day is very handy. Number one, you don't have to think about it so much and it, those things will get done. Number two, it, what, it, what, what any kind of structure does is facilitate the positive movement of vata in the body. And when vata is moving positively, that means it's easier for prana to move positively. Prana is the good variety of the air element. Vata is the dosha, the disturbed variety of the air element. So structure, healthy structure, encourages vata to move in the right direction. Bad habits, and a bad habit is not necessarily a really terrible habit. It's just, it can also be something that is not inherently bad, but may not be working for you at this time in your life. Uh, and, and, and this is why it's so important to evaluate all the habits that you have and try to determine which ones of them are serving you and which ones are not. The Sanskrit word samskara is also a very interesting word. Many people who have studied yoga think of samskara as being a very negative thing, that you have a samskara which has been created by some kind of habitual behavior, and as a result of that samskara, you, are, you have vasanas, and these are tendencies that are always causing you to do certain things that may or may not be benefiting you. Whereas in traditional non-yogic contexts in India, the word samskara is a positive thing. And that ref reflects, uh, a samskara is a ritual that is performed for the purpose of encouraging a positive pattern to occur. So after a child is, there are said to be 16 samskaras that a, an individual uh, should, should, that should be applied to a an individual during their life. And among them is, for example, the first time the child is named. So that name, the, the phonetic value of the first letter is going to accompany them all through life. And there are different ways of deciding what that first letter should be, but making a conscious choice and then applying it is establishing a particular kind of samskara hope, that will hopefully be positive for that individual. The first time that the hair is cut, because hair, as Samson knew, <clears throat> is something that can, uh, in which your your shakti, your prana, your power can be contained. The first time the child eats solid food. All of these things, we are trying to establish a pattern from the beginning that will be a positive pattern for that child for the rest of its natural life. So. It, th these are ex and 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 these samskaras are are initiated in the context of some sort of ritual. A a a ritual is a a a, a practice, a routine that has some ri some religious or spiritual connection of some kind. Ritualized behaviors are behaviors that often they 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 are not religious or spiritual, except to the individual who is performing them. A behavior becomes ritualized often when that person believes that they need to perform that in order either to evade bad fortune or to promote good fortune. In which case, it becomes often kind of a superstition. But the the premise of any kind of ritual is that there is a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there are specific steps that need to be followed. And in the following of these steps, that promotes the channeling of the energy that is desired to be channeled for the purpose that is meant to occur. And so there is value to be had when you are attempting to worship something to develop a ritual. Now, if you develop a ritual and then it becomes second nature and then it becomes simply repetition in which you're no longer paying attention to it, then its value has become 
substantially decreased. But instead, if that is, if you create a pattern, a ritual, and as a result of that ritual, every time you start performing it, it in fact encourages your attention to go even more deeply into the focus that you have chosen that is required for this uh, action that you want to perform for the result that you, you want to achieve, then that ritual will actually assist you <clears throat> moment by moment to move in the direction that you want to go. So uh, it is very much like everything else in, in human life. It, a ritual is a two-edged sword, properly employed as people do when they perform puja, which is a worship ritual characterized, very characteristic of, of India, and <clears throat> tantric ritual, which is also a kind of <clears throat> puja, um, often in a much more highly structured and very much more focused and very much more, not necessarily rigid, but but very, very much more uh, 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 cha channeled kind of way and channeled of course because you're attempting to accumulate control and eventually employ shakti of some kind not just the shakti of your physical body the prana but often shaktis that are more subtle and that are more refined hopefully but certainly that can act in a, a, they can act at a, even at a distance. They can act even in ways that are not really understandable in by by the kind of physics we know in the uh, in the in the material world. So, ritual has the potential because because it can act as a mnemonic. It can assist you. When you sit down to perform a particular ritual, it can assist you to remember the frame of mind that you were in during the last time you performed the ritual, and that can assist you to get back easily into that frame of mind and go deeper into that perspective of consciousness that you were attempting to go into. All of these habits, rituals, routines, all of these different structures that we create for ourselves can be valuable structures so long as we are maintaining our awareness of them. And by maintaining that awareness, we are able to continuously evaluate whether they are continuing to serve our purposes. As soon as something stops serving your purpose, then you have to start thinking. You don't have to stop it immediately, but you have to start thinking about how you might alter that in order to uh, be able to regain the purpose that you want to achieve. This is standard Ayurveda. In fact, it's often said in Ayurveda that when you find a medicine that is working for someone, that is the medicine. You should continue giving them the medicine until it starts, until it either stops working or stops <clears throat> or starts having the opposite effect. So it's often good to do this with ritual also. Continue doing it as long as it is benefiting you or until it starts even giving you the opposite effect. Then hopefully you have, re you have some idea of how you might change it and change it as preferably on a good day at a good time with full attention. And then hopefully what will happen is there will be a good transition where the value that you've obtained from the previous iteration of the ritual will be continued into the next version of the ritual. But when it comes to habits that have simply cropped up and and found their way into your psyche and become part of your personality and are really not serving you anymore, but simply have become unconscious things you continue to do. Get rid of them as soon as you can. Actively think about different ways of doing those things so you are no longer falling into those patterns. 
and take advantage of the fact that by creating new rituals, you will be able often to have that new ritual over over print, overshadow, overlay itself on top of the old one so that the old one will simply dwindle. Because when you stop reinforcing these rituals by performing them all the time, you will start to forget them. And this, of course, is why if you do not do something for a long time, you often will have to take a, a, a period of time, maybe a few days, until you can do that thing again, like riding a bicycle, like speaking a language, whatever it may be. Take advantage of routines, rituals, and habits. Don't let them take advantage of you. Om Namah Shivaya. Mm-hmm.